So can you guys hear me? Okay, yep. great. Mm. Okay, let's start. Let me share my screen with you. Can you guys see my slide? Yeah. Okay, cool. So today will be the last lecture. I mean, uh, the formal lecture. Well, this will be the last lecture. <clears throat> and uh, after today, that will be your project time. So pretty much next week, that will be a kind of an individual meeting uh, so that I can resolve any potential questions for your team, okay, for next uh, pro, uh, next week, and then the day uh, the week after next one that will be your demo demo day, right? So technically, we have um, uh, two weeks, right? So for today in this uh, lecture, we we're gonna cover uh, three uh, topics. The first one will be the meeting schedule. So I will set up a, I will show you the time schedule for each team. And then the another two topics will be the kind of applications of optimization. Uh, the first application will be the, in the area of machine learning. So that I hope that I can give you some um, kind of a flavor of the optimization, how optimization is used in machine learning. Uh, the second application will be uh, structural design. So that would be the two applications. Uh, in total, I think this lecture will be uh, kind of a very busy. We have about more than 50 uh, pages, uh, 50 slides. So I might be like talk a little bit faster. Okay, so let's aim at probably uh, 650, something like this. Hopefully we can end at that time. Okay. So for the uh, first topic, um, here, this is a design or this is a schedule for all teams, okay? And uh, again, I think I might, you know, kind of, um, uh, in this table, there may be two or three, three students. Uh, I mean, they are not listed here. I don't know why, because this table is generated based on your submission for, uh, literature view. Maybe uh, some of you haven't submitted. Okay, uh, if you are the one who are not listed here, so please email me, and then your time will be um, um, on Wednesday, pretty much uh, April twenty seconds. Okay, so uh, let's look at this kind of table. So each team will have about one, about ten minutes. Okay, starting from five thirty and you know, just one group by another group. And hopefully I named your project and your uh, members correctly. Uh, if not, also please email me to correct this. But overall, this is a schedule for it. Uh, we will use a Zoom to, you know, kind of communicate. So you can just wait for your uh, time slots and then jump in. 
Um, so I think at least uh, one of your team uh, should be uh, presenting during that time because you want to, uh, for this kind of uh, 10 minutes, um, you can ask any questions. You can show me your kind of a preliminary result and also you can ask me any kind of a coding uh, or you know some kind of a debugging issue or you know uh, those kind of things so that I can give you a kind of a prompt a feedback so you can you know uh, make sure that your project is on track okay so that would be the purpose of 10 minutes and uh, I understand that 10 minutes might be too little for some groups right so if so uh, you we can schedule another one after you know that meeting. Uh, we are trying to use ten minutes to you know kind of um, resolve any potential questions, but sometimes you may need more time. Then we can schedule another time. Okay, so that's the kind of a mechanism to do this uh, project meeting. Uh, after that, you will have one week to you kind of fine tune your model and your output. Okay. Mm. So I think uh, I haven't prepared the project uh, grading policy, but essentially you need to uh, answer four questions. So what's the problem, right? And um, uh, how do you solve it? And what's the result? And what, the, what does the result mean, right? This kind of four questions. As long as you can uh, clearly clarify these four questions, then I'm good, okay? So that would be the kind of a, a criteria for your project, okay? Uh, any questions about this kind of a project meeting? Uh, okay, I think Hosai is asking a question, says, do we have a template of, or structure to follow the presentation? Uh, I don't want to give the template. I hope that everybody can have, uh, you know, uh, your own way to tell your story. As long as you can answer the four basic questions, right? What's your problem? How do you solve it? What's the result? And what does it mean, right? That'd be the four questions. So you can have a very like fancy way to present your story or, you know, so I don't want to limit your, the way you present, okay? Uh, as long as you can answer the four basic questions, then good. Uh, maybe one easy way to follow is that just, you know, uh, kind of uh, using four sections, right? What's the problem? What's the method? And what's the result? And um, what does it mean, right? You can use these kind of things, or you can have under, uh, some other, you know, kind of fancy, kind of you have, uh, you know, attractive opening or something like this. That would be preferred, okay? Again, this is uh, the project. I think it's, um, it's, it's not only about optimiza optimization, it's also about how to deliver your result, okay? It's a, I think it's a good exercise for you to present some kind of, a, you know, a fancy stuff, right? How to uh, kind of make sure that your idea is um, uh, kind of um, successfully or clearly uh, delivered and the people or the audience can be uh, attracted, okay? So I don't have any template for you, okay? So that would be the answer for this template. Uh, again, uh, if no other questions, so we will jump to our two topics today. So that would be the first one will be machine learning. Okay, so I think uh, machine learning, you may you know heard of this term like a million times, right? So uh, every day is pretty much that everything, every area, we are talking about machine learning or, you know, even, you know, a lot of things, uh, a lot of science or a lot of people are actually using machine learning to do uh, a lot of, um, you know, very good, powerful stuff. Again, machine learning is true, it's very powerful. It has, um, you know, uh, tons of uh, techniques. You know, a lot of, uh, you know, machine learning scientists or data scientists, they're actually proposing or they are improving performance of machine learning systems. Okay, so that's a lot of, uh, a kind of techniques are used. But among these techniques, optimization is the heart of machine learning. So I would say um, machine learning is mostly about optimization plus some uh, statistics, okay? But optimization is the kind of uh, the, the heart of machine learning, especially how you train your model, okay? Uh, here I list the term, right? When I highlight it as red color, it says, 
optimization or machine learning is about to minimize the loss function. Okay, that's the kind of things. So in this in this sentence, we have two terms: minimization and loss function. That's the kind of a two. Um, I would say the 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 critical uh, components in machine learning, and of course, as I mentioned, machine learning has a lot of uh, contents. It's impossible to you know kind of uh, compress this kind of contents in just like um, thirty or forty minutes uh, lecture, right? So, but this lecture, I try I'm trying to uh, give you some examples how the optimizations are used in machine learning. So that you, you will know that the optimization is really uh, kind of a, a powerful tool for many areas, uh, especially for machine learning. Okay, so let's say uh, again for machine learning two topics, right? How to model, so pretty much how to you know construct the objective loss function. Okay, loss function is how to evaluate your model. That means loss function, and also how to optimize it optimization algorithm, that will be the second component. So let's start with the first one, the model, right? How do we propose our objective or how do we com convert a machine learning problem into an optimization problem? So let's say generally for machine learning, you're actually learning the, what do you learn? You are learning the kind of a function, right? So we have an input X. And then based on some function or some model, you can have an output Y. So the idea is that in real world, right, you can have a lot of, um, you know, this kind of equation, Y equal to F of X, right? So which means that um, given some kind of uh, uh, data, you can predict the performance or some other stuff, right? So that would be the kind of uh, the model is basically the F, okay? And depends on, you know, what Y is, there will be two types. If Y, if the output is a label, for example, uh, if you say like, um, if the result is good or bad, something like this, right? This like just good or bad, that would be a label. Or is, a, you know, in the figure, does it, that kind of, uh, you know, figure or that kind of um, uh, images contains a cat or a dog, you know, that would be a kind of label, right? You want to label the images as cat or dog or even a cow, something like this, right? That would be a label. It's kind of a discrete, right? So just some uh, very limited label, just, you know, uh, good or bad, cat, dog, cow. These are labels. This kind of a question or is called classification problems. You're trying to classify what kind of a thing is, uh, the X is, okay? That's classification. Uh, another type is regression. Regression is that, you are trying to predict a quantity. So for example, you're trying to predict what is um, the kind of uh, revenue for a kind of a restaurant in a, in a day, right? Or you want to predict what's your, you know, the kind of, um, I would say your cost tomorrow, something like this, that would be the quantity. Or another way that, another example is, for example, we, we have a phone, right? So you want to know that uh, when your battery will die, right? So what's the remaining life or remaining useful life of your battery? So that also a kind of, it's a quantity, right? How many days, how many hours? There's a quantity. So to predict such kind of things is called regression, okay? Essentially, they have two types. Uh, there, there might be some other, you know, kind of a, a problems called um, clustering. So for clustering is uh, you don't have Y, you just have a bunch of X, right? But you want to group them and, um, so that would be a clustering. Um, uh, essentially, we have a classification and a regression. Okay, it's two types. Uh, for clustering, we actually can, uh, you know, kind of um, group the clustering problem to a classification, something like this. Okay, so that would be the a major type of machine learning problem. So we will introduce like um, uh, three type of uh, models. Uh, they are you know, kind of three problems, pretty, pretty much, right? very classic problems. Uh, some are classification problem, some are regression. So let's start with regression. So for the first problem, regression. Uh, regression is not really a fun, it's not really something new. Actually, you are doing regression in your exam too. Uh, if, you, if you remember, you are trying to predict, right? Predict how many positive cases for the COVID-19, right? 
you want to try, you're trying to predict the curve. So that kind of thing is regression because you're trying to predict a quantity, right? And also this is a kind of a nonlinear regression because our model, let me see, let me try to uh, use a laser pointer to show something like this. So the model here is not linear, right? It's a very kind of a, a very curvy things, right? So that would be a nonlinear regression. And for regression, it's pretty much like a, a data fitting, right? So you have a model and then you have for a you know, kind of a data, right? This is the one, two, three, four, eight. You have eight samples, eight data samples. And for each data, you can, uh, the last function here, this is called last function. Last means like a kind of cost, right? What's your last? So the last is kind of like a, the deviation of your model prediction to the real data, okay? Yi, that would be the real observation. And this kind of A over this kind of thing is your model prediction. You want to minimize the deviation or the error between these two, right? Between the true value and your prediction value. So that's called least square uh, kind of a loss function. This is a very commonly used uh, loss function, okay? And then for your model, you can say that you can plug in your like eight samples into the formula, right? You will get a function like this. And then optimization comes, right? You're trying to figure out the parameters in your model, right? You are learning the model's parameters based on the data, right? That is learning. Learning is pretty much trying to solve out the parameters, okay? And then after you, so again, I just omit the, I just skip the optimization, right? Because we already solve it, right? So we know how to optimize this problem. And when the parameters are figured out, right? ABC is solved, then we can use this kind of ABC to predict, correct? So which means that given any date, for example, date 17, you can actually predict what's the quantity of that uh, positive cases. So this is a linear regression we are kind of doing like in the exam too, right? Uh, this is a very simple one. In real case, the data, again, the data will be you know, kind of a lot of data. And this is kind of very small data. Uh, you may know another term, it's called big data, right? Big data means you have like a million or you know, a, a gigabyte, a lot of data you want to process. And then that will be another kind of scenario. But the essential idea is the same. You're trying to optimize the last function, okay? And then after you solve out or optimize the last function, you can have some parameters and then use the parameters in the model trying to predict some quantity. This is called regression, okay? Uh, this kind of regression is nonlinear. Uh, nonlinear regression is not that, um, it's useful, but people, Sometimes I prefer linear regression because it's much simpler. So for example, here is a, another a kind of a problem. So you are trying to predict your MPG of the car. For example, MPG is a mile per gallon, right? You want to know uh, how many miles your car can you know, kind of drive, right? Given one gallon uh, gas, right? And then the the data you can know or the features you can observe for your specific car is four things. One is that you, you can know what is the acceleration of your car, right? And also you can you know the weight of your car and also how many like miles you already travel, something like this. I think that would be the displacement. And also the horsepower. Horsepower means like, you know, what's the engine's horsepower, right? So that would be the kind of a four, uh, indicators or kind of for uh, people will call this uh, in machine learning, they, they call this features. Uh, features means like, uh, you know, just x1, x, uh, x2, x3, x4, right? For x is the vector of uh, a lot of components, a lot of elements. This is a, a kind of a x is a vector. And based on the x, you want to predict the y response, okay? That is a problem. And people will use a very simple model. It's called linear model, right? Kind of a y equals beta one times x one, right? This is a kind of a uh, feature one, feature two, feature three, and a feature four. And then you have for each feature, you will have a weight, which is beta, okay? So that will be the linear uh, kind of a model. 
right? This is a very uh, super simple model. And people, you know, come, you know, they prefer this simple model because you can easily solve out the parameters. Again, for the last function, right, we want, we have this model and then how, what's the objective in this problem, right? The objective is again, is the kind of a law, least square, right? We have the model prediction, which is, uh, you know, this portion, right? And also we have the real kind of a data. So we want to minimize their kind of error sum, right? This is kind of square sum, okay? This is a least square uh, loss function. So again, um, objective is our optimization term, term, but in machine learning, people call it a loss function, okay? They are same, just objective function. And then you can plug in the data, right? We have, um, uh, actually this is the data is from MATLAB. If I have time, I can give you some uh, demo. So we have about 400 uh, samples, okay? Each sample is just one row, okay? This is a one row, it's one car, one specific car. And then for one specific car, you can plug in the kind of, you know, uh, this kind of sum term, right? And then you can have one term, and then you can plus all the 400 cars, a kind of prediction uh, error together, then that would be the last function. Again, if you, from the optimizations perspective, you can say this is a, this is a what? This is a very simple quadratic optimization, right? It's just a quadratic, quadratic uh, optimization. We have a lot of methods trying to solve it, right? So that's very simple to solve this kind of quadratic optimization. Uh, then we can, uh, I just skip the optimization procedure. We can, you know, after optimization, we can get four, you know, uh, kind of the, the, the weight, right? Beta one is minus 0 0.02, uh, something like this, right? This is a kind of a, a, the optimal solution. And if we have this kind of a solution, then given any new X, right? And in, given any new car, if you have this kind of a four features, then I can easily compute the MPG. We can easily predict it, right? This is a linear regression. We just have a linear model and a quadratic uh, loss function, and then we can solve it. Okay, so this is called linear regression. It's simple. Uh, so, but sometimes linear regression is not uh, enough. The reason is there are some drawbacks of linear regression. Uh, the drawback is sometimes pe people will call overfitting. So you can think about this question. Uh, if you have a kind of a features, for example, you have a feature like a hundred different features, okay? Like uh, X1, X2, X4, X100, a lot of features, right? a lot of X. But you only have um, about maybe just two or three data. For example, you just have uh, three or four cars, right? And then how do you compute the hundred different parameters, a hundred different ways, right? There will be a lot of uh, different combination, right? So the optimal solution will be, you know, kind of it's not unique. There are many, many feasible solutions. So you want to pick the one that gives you the, you know, the best uh, prediction, right? So you want something like a, which is a more reasonable solution. So people will are trying to regulate this kind of a solution. So they want the first thing they can think of is that they hope that the coefficient could be as small as possible. Because if your beta or your parameters, they have a very weird combination and they can fit the data, but the beta will be somehow like, a, for example, this will be a million, this will be a billion, something like this, right? It's really a huge number and it's not stable. So you can predict a very wrong result. So people don't want this kind of things. And that kind of thing is called overfitting. Your coefficient is too large or your parameter is too large. So people are trying to um, kind of penalize this kind of large um, kind of parameters. So that, that one is called a constraints or you know, linear regression with constraints. Okay, this is a, this is a, a more kind of a, a widely adopted methods because this can avoid the overfitting or sometimes it can give you some um, a good result. Uh, the idea is that we have uh, two, uh, you know, two commonly used uh, constraints. 
So one is that we hope that the absolute value of each weight, we sum them together, that will be a very small. So this is called L1, right? L1 long. And L2, that will be the square sum. Let's talk about the first one. Uh, if we have a model, right? this is a previous linear model, and then we hope that the coefficient is small, it's very small, right? Somehow, for example, we can give it some constraints. Or in other way, we can actually, in our objective function, right, we can convert a constraint into a kind of a penalty term, right? So we can have a lambda and also uh, the absolute value for each weight, right? We can add up together. This will be the L1 uh, constraints, okay? And then we have a lambda. So lambda means like uh, uh, our kind of a weight for the uh, constraints, right? If lambda is huge, then we hope that the beta will be as small as possible. And this kind of thing is called lasso regression, okay? Because it has this kind of L1 norm. Lasso is represent some kind of terms we can look up later. But pretty much that's the idea. We're trying to add this kind of penalty term here. Uh, so what here, this is the result. So the horizontal axis is the lambda, the lambda here. For example, here, the, if lambda equals to one, this is a specific to one, then we will correspond to four betas, right? Corresponding to one solutions, okay? So this is a, this curve is beta one, this curve is beta two, this is beta three, then is beta four. So that's the kind of, a, for a specific beta, we can have a, a specific solution. Uh, for one lambda, we'll have a specific beta, right? That would be the solutions. And also we can generate a lot of a different beta, right? For example, smaller beta or large beta, right? You can get different solutions. So very, very interesting here. If the beta, you, you can say if we start from very small beta, for example, from zero, right? Then we can, all the betas are, you know, they, they have some kind of um, values, right? They are not zero. But when we gradually increase the lambda, lambda here, then what happened is that some beta or some coefficient will, you know, come to zero, we bec will become zero, right? This is a very interesting result because when we increase the beta, some terms or some beta will be kind of zero, there's no effect, right? We just eliminate them. And then when we continue to increase the number, for example, to some level, there will be only one, for example here, only beta two is the significant one, right? The other three will be, become zero. What does this mean? This is a very interesting uh, property of lasso regression. It means that for some lambda, actually we can, you know, kind of force some kind of features, the some beta to be zero, which means we can cancel or we can just eliminate these features. And it means that actually these features are just insignificant. They are not important at all. For example, the acceleration and the displacement, they are not important at all. Only the weight and horsepower are the key indicators in our problem, okay? So this is a very interesting result for last regression. So it, based on this kind of feature, it has a lot of uh, applications. So number one is it will denoise. So denoise means it can eliminate some kind of uh, you know uh, features which the model or think that these features are not important they are just noise we just ignore it or in other words we can do model selection right for example in our current model we have uh, four beta four features but actually only the weight and the horsepower you know is kind of uh, very important then we can only have the two terms and we just ignore the displacement and acceleration this is a usage for it we can select which feature is significant, okay? And also we can reduce overfitting, right? No matter how many uh, features we have, if I use this kind of a last regression, I can enforce some kind of term to be zero. Then I can actually have a very good model. So that's the kind of idea of a last regression by adding 
the kind of a penalty, you can get a very good result, right? You can cancel or eliminate some kind of a terms. Okay, this is called loss of regression, which is very useful. Hey, let me see, do you have any question for now for this kind of loss of regression? Uh, I know this lecture will be, uh, okay, Luis, you have some question, right? So this lecture will has a, a lot of information, so you can, you know, um, last regression. So uh, Luis's uh, question is, is last regression just applied for a linear regression? Um, so yes, so that's the model. It's, you can, because this, this kind of a specific formulation can have the, you know, very easy solution. Uh, but the idea of adding the L1 penalization, right? This is a kind of L1 or this kind of a penalty term. You can actually um, add to other uh, models, but mostly last regression is using this kind of linear model, okay? Because this is a very important. It's, um, you have a lot of uh, you know, features. Sometimes you will generate a hundred or even a thousand features but only a few of them are significant. So you want to pick which one, right? So in that case, you will use a kind of last regression and yes. So, but again, this, the idea of this kind of a penalty, you can add to some other stuff. For example, for our uh, COVID-19 model, you can actually you know, add this kind of things there, right? It's just constraints. But for this constraint, it has uh, uh, some meaning or it's more meaningful if we combine with linear regression, okay? Because if you look at this kind of, uh, I want to show you this. So that would be the, uh, again, this is the idea why sometimes NASA works. So if you look at the very left figure, right? So the contour here, this is our objective contour, right? And this is a, a square is actually the contour of uh, uh, constraints. And we can see that the, kind of, uh, you know, the optimal point will be along the one axis and the another axis will be just zero. So that's the idea, or that's the kind of a graphic explanation why lasso can generate some like a zero uh, kind of weights because of this kind of, a, you have a contour and the optimal solution will be just as along or on one axis, okay? So that's why you want to have this kind of a linear uh, modeling. But again, you may have some like nonlinear model. They should, they, they, they might work. Hmm. Yeah, that's very interesting result for this kind of a loss of regression. Yeah, uh, sometimes people call this uh, kind of a compressive sensing, right? So you have a very limited data, but you can have a good model. Okay, you can deploy it. So that's called loss of regression. Uh, there's another kind of a constraints. So besides use the absolute value, you can use the square value, right? For beta, you can square sum. So if you have this kind of a penalty, then you have another kind of regression model, which is called ridge regression. Uh, that's a totally uh, new, uh, different things. Uh, but to, I mean, you can uh, look up later. So I will skip this model. But generally, it will generate some model that has very small beta, but it cannot, uh, enforce some beta to be zero. Only Lasso can do this, okay? But ridge is also very useful. You can, you know, kind of uh, um, limit the beta to be a very small value. Uh, you can also the you can also see the result from here, right? Uh, if you look at this, is a kind of a ridge uh, kind of a regression, right? We have the L two constraints, which means that the square sum, right? So you can see the square sum actually is touching the contour is not along the axis. That's why the kind of, you know, square sum cannot have this kind of, you know, zero uh, coefficients. You can also see from the, this, from this kind of figure, okay? So that would be the uh, regression part. Then we'll jump to another different animal, right? This is called uh, a very different, uh, 
algorithm is called support vector machine or SVM. This is also a very useful and uh, I would say a kind of a simple method. Uh, support vector machine is for classification. So it's pretty much to classify uh, which type you are. For example here, in this figure we have a square, right? This is a square type, right? And this is a kind of a, a circle. So for each point, for example here, you will have one x1 and x2, right? So we just plot the feature here, or plot the samples here, right? And then we hope we can have a model that we can split these two types, right? We can predict, uh, you know, based on x1, x2, we can predict which type they are, right? So that would be a classification problem. So again, for this kind of a 2D problem, right? because these kind of samples are in the upper and these samples are in the lower, then we can draw a kind of a boundary, right? Draw a, draw a line, you can see that. We can have this line and then we can use that kind of line to determine if your point is on my right side, then that would be one type. If you're on the other side, that would be another type. So that's the, the way to do support vector machine. You pretty much you just draw a line to it, right? But for SVM, you will have, you can see that, you will have a lot of, you know, infinite way to draw the line, right? So which one you want? So actually there is an optimal one. Uh, this one we call it optimal because you can see that we have the maximum margin, right? We can have some like, you know, uh, at the boundary, you know, this kind of, you know, uh, samples and also samples. And this kind of, uh, their gap, between this group and the other group, between the groups, their gap are the maximum, right? So that will be the margin, maximum margin. So this kind of a plane is the one we want. Okay, so that's the idea of for support vector machine. So we hope that our kind of a boundary will, you know, have the maximum margin. Uh, sometimes this kind of a, the, this kind of, a, you know, uh, samples, they are called support, okay, because they just support these kind of boundaries. So that's why we say support vector, okay. Um, you can see that this is another graph showing a similar idea. This is a support vector, right? They are on the boundary. And then we hope we can draw a kind of a line that as large as, you know, the gap is as large as possible. And then here's uh, some mathematics here. Uh, for the gap, here, if you want to see, our model is also very simple, right? You can see here, the model is y equals to a, you know, x1, x2, xm, their combination, right? Just linear combination uh, with some like uh, bias. So this is a very simple model. It's also just a straight line, right? If we only have x1, x2, it's just a straight line. And then for this straight line, if we have one sample, for example, for this kind of, uh, Blue samples for the if we plug their coordinates into this kind of model, then I will have the y which is larger than one. Okay, so that's the idea of uh, this model. And for this kind of green samples, if I plug in their uh, plug their kind of coordinates into the model, so they come the result y will be smaller than uh, minus one. So that's by doing so, right? We can, given any kind of sample, we can compute their y. And if y is larger than one, we know it's kind of blue. If it's smaller than minus one, then we know it's green. So that's the idea how we predict, right? We have the model and then we can predict. But then this is the model, but how do we construct the objective, right? How do we uh, pick which weight, right? How do we pick the parameters w1 to wm? So the idea is that, again, we say we want to maximize the Kind of this kind of a margin, right? This kind of gap. So magically, this kind of a margin will be equal to two over the width long. Okay, that this kind of is too long, too long something like this. Okay, just square sum. Okay, so two over the square sum root. Okay, so that would be the. Uh, if you are interested, I can show you how to derive these kind of things. Okay, but just for now, just take it for granted. We have this kind of margin, right? We want to maximize two over this kind of things, right? 
And because this is kind of a, this is hard to understand, then to maximize this margin is essentially trying to minimize this kind of square sum, right? They are, this kind of two things, they are identical, right? If you want to maximize the gap or the margin, you're trying to minimize the delimit, right? Right, that would be this kind of things. And this is an objective, but you will have some constraint, right? You hope that all the samples are correctly uh, separated, right? For example, all the uh, blue, if the yi, if the real label is one, then you hope that your prediction will be larger than one. And for the samples that the label is minus one, you hope that your prediction will be smaller than minus one, right? So by doing so, all the samples are correctly separated by your model, and also your margin is kind of maximized. So that's a constraint, right? So this kind of problem is actually converted as an optimization problem, right? By trying to minimize the coefficient square sum, subject to each samples are correctly separated, right? So if the label is one, then we hope that prediction is larger than one. Uh, but these two constraints actually can be combined, right? So, the for example here, we can combine it with something like this, right? Let's look at again. We can multiply the wx must be this term with yi, right? So for case one, the product will be larger than one, right? And also for the second constraint, the left hand of this guy multiplied by yi is also larger than one. So we can actually uh, combine the two constraints into this, which means that your prediction, this is your prediction, and this is uh, the real data, this should have the same sign, right? So that means that you have a, pr a successful prediction. So that's, this is a model, correct? Do you know how to solve it? If I give you this for the, during the, during the exam. Hello guys, it's your turn to say something. <laughs> do you know how do we solve how do we solve this problem? We have a constrained problem, maybe. So this is a kind of a constrained problem, right? Constrained optimization. No. <laughs> or maybe. Anyway, so I hope that you can have some idea. This is a kind of constraint problem, right? We can use MATLAB to directly solve it. Um, yes, that's, that's uh, we don't need a linear integer programming because the decision or the variable here, the unknown W is a continuous value. So it's not an integer programming, okay? So we just use fmincon or some other stuff, we can do that. Uh, the unknown is continuous, okay? Uh, there's another way people are trying to do is uh, something like this. They are actually converting the constraints into a penalty term, okay? And this kind of a formulation, the bottom one is more, it kind of largely uh, uh, is more adapted, okay? People prefer this. One reason is that this is an unconstrained problem. Another reason is sometimes uh, the constraints, if there's no solutions that can meet all these constraints, which means that the samples are not separable. For example, here, we have some kind of, a, you know, a very, you know, weird uh, sample. For example, the blue guy here, right? This is just in the center of the, you know, kind of um, green uh, dot. So there's no way to separate this separate them into groups, which means there's no uh, W or B, they can, you know, you know can uh, kind of uh, meet this kind of constraints, right? Which means there's no solution. Even if you use F Lincoln, then you will get nothing because it's not feasible. So that's why sometimes people uh, prefer to, to use this guy, right? This is called a, a soft uh, constraint, right? Because you can uh, actually, uh, allow for some kind of data which is not uh, feasible. And this term you can see that this pretty much is that uh, put all the constraints that is uh, violated here 
into uh, into account, right? So if this kind of a prediction and the why they are actually, um, I would say, they are not uh, in the same way, then we will have some uh, kind of a penalty here, right? That's the idea of it. So again, this is a trying to, um, uh, you know, uh, solve this kind of problem, which is easier, and also it can allow for some kind of lawyers or kind of some, you know, some sometimes your data, most likely your data will not be, you know, uh, separable, right? There might be some noise. So this kind of formulation will be, you know, compatible to that kind of things. So again, the bottom one will be the widely used one, okay? So this is the idea of uh, support uh, vector machine or SVM. So any kind of uh, questions about the idea of it? So I hope that, are you clear about the kind of a general idea, right? So how to convert the classification problem into a optimization problem, right? Okay, okay, good. Yes, general idea. So I think we can only know the general ideas and uh, for the details, for example, how to derive this and how to do that, how to implement it. So that would be, we need a lot of other kind of reading, or, right? So we can do this later, but I hope that this can give you some general idea of this. And here is some kind of uh, application for this SVM uh, classification. So the, the data is this, right? This, uh, the problem is that we try, we're trying to classify the flower species, okay? So here you can see uh, on the right side, we have uh, you know, this kind of figure and this kind of figure. They, are, they look very similar, but they are different species. So we're trying to classify them, okay? And uh, the feature is we can measure their like, petals, uh, I would say their petals length and also the waist and also their like a uh, saddles, uh, super, I don't know how to pronounce this guy, but it's kind of a, to you know, measure their length and the waist. So we will have um, uh, four different numbers, right? To characterize a, each data. For example, we can measure this length and this waist, and then we can measure something like this, right? And then based on their data, we're trying to predict, or we're trying to uh, classify which species it is, right? So from the data, we can say this bunch of, uh, you know, the first uh, one will be Sentosa, and the last five was, last five will be the very color, right? So that would be the different labels. This is a classification problem, right? Then based on this data, we can train or we can, you know, this is X, right? This is a Y, this is, we can, we can say, for example, Sentosa will be one, and very color will be minus one, right? That will be our kind of a prediction. And then this is X. Then we can plug into the data here, XI and the YI, and we can, comp we can basically constrain or we can construct this kind of optimization problem, right? And then we can minimize the, this problem and give some weight, right? And then we can actually have this kind of, uh, you know, this is the result. Uh, we can have, uh, you know, you can see that if we plot the samples, we can see they are clearly separated, right? This is, um, uh, let's say the cross will be their color and the dot will be Sentosa. And we have a very huge margin, right? So that would be the kind of SVMs. Again, this is a, this is a MATLAB's, um, I think it's MATLAB's uh, demo. Uh, I don't think I have enough time to give you some demo. So later I will give you a separate PDF trying to include everything uh, or all the kind of uh, demos, okay? You can run, um, but for now I don't think I have the time. So this will be the application for SVM, right? You're just trying to support, uh, trying to classify the different, uh, you know, kind of classes, okay? Uh, any questions here? Okay, so this is again, this is kind of like a, good. This is kind of a similar, right? We just, uh, you know, uh, listen for fun, right? Just for fun. Uh, this is the end of the second uh, model. So the, our third one is a very powerful one, right? Which is called a neural network. You may know this, right? Neural networks, and then 
say uh, a lot of uh, right people have uh, used this kind of uh, neural network to do a lot of fancy uh, kind of um, uh, fancy stuff, right? Like uh, you know, people can train in the images, right? You can classify the images. You can uh, do the, uh, for example, the um, uh, how does that the speech recognition and uh, translation. A lot of stuff actually. They can use the neural networks to do this, especially for deep learning, right? They are actually one type of neural network. So today I give you some like very, very simple introduction to this. Uh, here, this link, I hope you can take a look at this link. So my images or my figures are comes from, it comes from this kind of link, okay? It's, uh, it's very, uh, I think this is very comprehensive uh, explanation for this topic. You can, if you have time, you can take a look. So the general idea is this, for neural network, you have, uh, you know, kind of uh, the very, very left column, they are, they are the X, this X, you know, because our uh, data, for each data, they have uh, different uh, features, right? This is a feature one, feature two, and a feature, a lot of features, right? You can put it here, that's one node. <clears throat> and then on the right side, that would be the output. It could be predict a quantity, or you can predict some labels, okay? That would be the output. In between, you will have a lot of hidden layers, okay? There are hidden. You can have a lot, uh, a lot of layers. So, for example, uh, I think Microsoft generates some like um, a neural network with like a hundred something like layers, okay? A lot of different layers. That will be deep learning. But here we have a, just use this kind of a, as an example, right? We have two hidden layers, right? They are trying to do some fancy stuff here. And the exact model is something like this. So uh, let me try to avoid this guy. Just a second. Uh, if you look at the very right, this is a kind of a, we have a zoom. We zoom in to the model, right? We have a lot of layers and uh, each layer will contain some nodes, right? For example, for this node, uh, the computing of this node is very easy. So the output of this node will be a, see that, aj, right? It equals to, equals to what? It's actually the linear combination of the previous node, okay? This is a previous node. We just have a, you know, kind of, a, there's, for each edge, we will have one weight. So the weight times this kind of, a, the value here, and the weight times value here, right? So that would be the kind of weighted sum of the previous layer of, for all nodes, okay? And then the summation will be sometimes a huge number, right? So which is um, not good. So people will use kind of a sigmoid function. This function is trying to regulate uh, the output in between zero and one. So which means that even though when I have a lot of uh, weighted sum, the number may be a huge, right? Maybe like a million, but by using the sigmoid, then I can actually output the output of each node will be just in between zero and one so that I can regulate the model, right? Otherwise the model will be, you know, kind of go crazily. So that's the idea. So the model is pretty simple, right? For each node, you just repeatedly compute the weightiest sum of previous layers and then output the next layers. That's it. So that's a model. And for this model, right? this is the model, but how do you evaluate your model, right? What's the loss function? So the last function for neural network, uh, okay, let me see if we have some, oh, there's no question. Uh, for the last function, or how do we evaluate, again, here's, oh, here's what? Here's the, what is this? This square, right? I hope that you can recognize. This is a least square. So for one X, I will use this model for any input X. I will use this model to yes norm or use this model to predict a y x right. That is the output, and then this is a prediction y of x, and we compare this y of x prediction with the true value a, with the true uh, you know observation true data right. We want to uh, minimize their error squares right. So that would be the least square uh, loss function again right. It's it's a very common use. So for any X, I just, you know, follow the previous, you know, kind of this kind of a computing um, uh, kind of a rules, right? 
I can, this, this one is the input, and then for each node for the first this layer, I just switch it on and then <coughs> regulate it. The output of this node will be two and zero and one. And then I can do the second layer and then final layers, right? And then I can compute the Y. So for all the input X, I can give a Y, this is a prediction. And I compare with the real response, right? Then that, the error will be, uh, I want to minimize, right? And what is the decision? What is unknown? The unknown in this model is the weight of each edge, okay? Because for each edge, we will have a W here. So if you, let me just jump back. So you can see that for each edge, I will have a weight W here, right? W is the unknown. I'm trying to figure out what is W, right? If all the W or all the weight are determined, then my neural network is kind of determined, okay? So our unknown value is the weight, the W, and also, of course, the bias here, right? That would be the two things. So this is the model. This is the neural network model. Super simple, right? We have the least square sum, and that's the objective, and uh, the parameters will be W. So this is a model for it. And how do we minimize these kind of things? Um, any suggestions? If you have this kind of problem, like, uh, you know, I'll tell you what. So this problem was kind of solved by uh, maybe like 35 years ago. So if you are like, uh, you know, come back, if you are born like uh, 40 years ago, like right? 40 years earlier, how do you solve it? You have this kind of a model. Any idea? How do you solve, how do you minimize this problem? Which algorithm you want to use? Any suggestions? Come on. We have uh, just a limb one, right? We have a lot of algorithms trying to minimize uh, interior points. Uh, Newtons, uh, they are very hard actually. <laughs> the simplest one actually, steep descent, okay? Just this one. So this one is a uh, very uh, it's simple, right? But that is the algorithm used to train the neural network used in deep learning, steep descent, okay? That's the algorithm. So in steep descent, we have, uh, uh, I'm trying to, yeah, this is, uh, I just, you know, show you. In steepest descent, we have two steps, right? Step one is trying to find the gradient, right? And then the search direction will be the negative of the gradient, correct? So that's the step one. Step two, we are trying to determine the best distance, right? That determine the D, right? So that would be the, algorithm so i hope that you can record this algorithm right steep descent we just find the gradient and then give you some distance and then update the solution so that would be the exactly this kind of uh, algorithm okay but you know this is not the end because there is a very you know very important very hard problem is how to compute the gradient if you look let's look at this you have a lot of uh, W, right? And uh, they're kind of uh, cascaded uh, in kind of layers. How do you compute the, you know, the gradients with respect to all the edges? This is a very hard problem, okay? And I think about 35 years ago, how to compute the gradient? Uh, there's a very, uh, you know, a very, kind of a very clever guy, right? This, uh, if you look, can look at this, uh, this three, I think the three gentlemen, right? David, um, Geoffrey, and William, they actually, they invented a kind of a way, it's called the back propagation. This is a very novel algorithm. It can compute the gradient, right? Uh, there are a lot of uh, mathematics involved, but I just, uh, so I just gave it. Um, but again, that's trying to use back propagation to solve the, or just to try to figure out the gradient of this with respect to the weight. Okay, let's try to find it. 
And uh, the Jarfe here, this is a, this gentleman, is one of the co-author. And uh, he is actually uh, is called the father of deep learning. Okay, uh, one contribution is this kind of uh, you know uh, this algorithm as a key contribution. Again, uh, you may you may heard of that that Jarfe actually wins the Turing uh, Prize, right? So that's uh, the actually. It's very uh, prestigious uh, algorithm um, price. Okay, so this algorithm trying to, you know how to figure out the gradient actually is a key, right? It's key to train the neural network because if you have the gradient, then it seems like everything is solved, right? And then it's also the key to sort of train the deep learning model because for deep learning, what is deep learning? Deep learning is nothing but the you know neural network has a lot of uh, hidden layers. That's kind of a, that's a deep learning, right? So if you want to train deep learning, then you have to use like the back propagation. Okay, so this is uh, the step one, right? We are trying to again. We say that for steep descent, we have two steps. Step one is trying to figure out the gradient, and we have this kind of a back propagation to figure out the gradient. And what is second step? We're trying to determine the moving distance, right? So here's very different, uh, you know, unlike our steep descent algorithm, right? Because in our steep descent, what we do, we are trying to evaluate all the points along that direction, right? That is our methods. But this is a, sometimes this is a very hard or even impossible for deep learning because your data, what is your data? Your data is kind of a, Gigabyte, megabyte, right? There's a lot of uh, data. You cannot really, even for one evaluation, is very expensive. So you don't really want to evaluate all the points. So you have to, you know, use other way to determine your, you know, moving distance. For example, here in this model, we say this is a gradient of the car, the gradient of the cost, right? The C, the gradient of the objective we figure out. I'm sorry, here should be the gradient of C. I, I didn't change it. So this is a, the kind of a del C, okay? That's the gradient of the cost function. And then eta, eta is the distance, right? Eta is the kind of a distance D, right, in our version. But in machine learning, people call it learning rate, okay? Learning rate is the value here. It's a constant value, so what's, it's not, it's, a, it's just a number, right? What's the number here should be? How to, you know, uh, pick the eta here? That would be the learning rate. Uh, so, because it's impossible to, you know, kind of compare different eta. So people have some other ways to compute the eta, okay? So that's the, uh, and then people call this uh, kind of a learning rate eta, right? Which is our, uh, walking distance, right? And the people have different strategies or different policy to update this data. And the uh, different policy, we have uh, different rules. And they actually, they are called by different, you know, kind of, um, uh, they have different uh, lame. For example, this is kind of SGD. Uh, SGD is something like this. So uh, SGD is that, it's called a stochastic gradient descent. Actually, it's a, uh, uh, it's not about learning rate, it's about how to compute the gradient. So for the gradient, because we have, uh, you know, the data is big. So when computing the gradient, we don't use the whole data to compute the gradient. We only, you know, kind of randomly pick a very small portion of the data. At each time, we just pick a small portion and to compute the gradient. That is called stochastic gradient, okay? That is one way to, you know, um, kind of make the algorithm faster. And another one, this is kind of other gradient. This kind of thing is talking about, it's kind of like a conjugate gradient methods. It's, uh, the idea is that we'll keep some information of previous gradient, okay? Other than just use the current gradient. So this is kind of other grad. Uh, the most commonly used one is called Adam, okay? Adaptive movement estimation. Again, for each algorithm, they will have a specific, you know, way to update uh, eta, okay? And if you want to know something about, uh, some details about this algorithm, you can look into this, uh, I mean, this link, okay?
for now, this, uh, this algorithm, they are just standard library, just call them, okay? You don't need to implement them. But I hope that this kind of a short lecture can give you some idea what's inside of the you know, neural network and how they train the neural network, okay? It's nothing but the steady descent, okay? And they have a fancy way to compute the gradient and they have fancy way to determine the, or the, the distance, okay? So that's the idea of it. Uh, again, this is a kind of a machine learning a, you know, resource in MATLAB. You can, if you have time, you can take a look. Uh, I, for now, I have, uh, you know, kind of um, end my first topic, right, about machine learning, uh, the optimization applications in machine learning, right? So hopefully by this kind of uh, several examples, you can know that how the optimization is used in machine learning. So pretty much is machine learning is about to convert the model into a loss function and then trying to optimize it, right? So any questions here before I, you know, jump to another totally new or totally different topic? Okay, you seem that everybody is happy. Um, again, this is a lecture, right? Or it's kind of like a seminar, you just, you know, uh, you know to kind of take it for fun, right? Uh, again, this is another kind of a machine learning uh, in Python. You can use this kind of, a, you know, uh, just take a look at this one. They have a lot of algorithms. So for now, nowadays, machine learning, they are actually uh, pretty standardized. They are standardized and you can, it's like a building, it's kind of like a building block. You just use it. You don't need to care about the implementation, okay? It's just like you just grab, just like you are doing some like a, design some PowerPoint or slides, you just drag and place, and then you can have the model, okay? So that's the kind of the current status for this learning. But I hope that you can uh, have some idea about the inside of it. So for the second topic, or the second application of op optimization, is pretty much called structural optimization. Is how to, is kind of a, the applications in structural design. Okay, so for structure design, here's something like this, right? So I don't know, I think that everybody take the course called uh, sta uh, statics, right? Or the name, statics, do you? So this is, um, this is statics, right? That's great. So this is statics problem, right? Give a trust structure. This is a kind of a trust structure, right? And then what we can do is actually what? The optimization is that for each beam, right? For each beam, we can determine the width or the size, right? For example, here, uh, in order to hold a larger kind of a, you know weight, so we can make sure that this kind of a beam, this set of beams are kind of a larger, right? So that they can hold more weight. This is a kind of a sizing optimization. The only unknown or the only decision you can do is to change their size, okay? This is a very first or very simple way to do optimization for structure. And later, so actually people think they might be, they can do more. So something like this. So instead of using this kind of a trust structure, they can use some plate, right? And also in a plate, they can have, a, you know, kind of a punch some holes. And uh, the optimization here is that they can determine what's the shape, right, of this kind of each hose, right? That would be kind of a shape optimization. This is a kind of a second stage. Nowadays, there's a, another very fancy way, it's called topology optimization. You just have an initial plate, right? This is the plate. And then you just pump, punch a lot of holes, right? You just punch a lot of holes, just place the holes here. And then the total mass or the total weight will be minimized, but it also can support or it can hold the weight. This is called topology optimization. Again, you don't know how many holes you need. You don't know how, what's the size, what's the shape of each hole, okay? This is a topology optimization. Right, so this is, a, they are all optimizations. And uh, they, you know, let's go through them again. 
for the size optimization, the design you can do is the size of each beam. For the shape, is actually you can determine what's the shape, right? what's the size. And for here, for the topology, you want to determine at each location, is there a hole or not, right? You want to actually punch the, the holes, right? You want to know whether, where, everywhere is the same, okay? So you can see it's very, the decisions, you can have much more freedoms, but it's more hard, right? It's kind of harder to solve this. So let's start from uh, our very simple one, right? Which is this kind of a sizing optimization. So here, this is an example in the, in the book, okay? In the book, we have a two element truss, okay? This kind of truss, we have element one and element two, okay, this truss. And the cross section, if you cut it, it looks like this. It's just a hollow round tube, okay? And the outer diameter, is 35 millimeter, it's determined. The unknown here is actually the T, okay? This is the, you want to, you want to uh, de decide what's the thickness of this kind of tube so that you can, you know, the objective is that you are trying to minimize the total mass, right? You want to reduce the weight. But this truss structure is designed to hold 20 kilo newtons weight, okay? So you want to hold this one. Again, this is a constraint, right? You cannot have a too small T because if your thickness is too small, then this kind of, you know, the strength, the material strength is not enough. So basically the element one will fail because of the tensile, right? Tensile means you just pull them. The tensile stress and element two will fail because the compressive and the buckling, right? So that would be the kind of a constraints you need to consider, right? So this is a kind of very simple question, right? You can actually, for example, here, for the mass, you can simply compute the volume, which is here, and then multiply by the density, right? This is a mass. And you can write the objective with respect to the T, okay? This is T is a thickness. This is a the decision variable, okay? And then you are subjecting to many uh, kind of three constraints, right? One is the tension, which means element one, the tensile stress is, you know, is too large for the uh, kind of um, strength, right? And then for element two, it could be, you know, the compressive uh, stress is too large, or it could be like a buckling, something like this. You have three uh, kind of constraints. And then again, this kind of a structural design problem, right? is actually converted to a, what? This optimization problem, right? So for this problem, it's a constraint optimization and also this continuous problem, right? So we can easily solve it by like using MATLAB or anything you want, right? So that would be the, the idea of it. And uh, actually, this is a plot for the constraint, uh, the kind of a G1 and a G3, you can see it like this. This is a constraint value for different T. And the zero, this is our constraints. So we hope that, for example, if you look at the buckling constraints, right? Uh, this point is a critical point, which is equal to 5.2. So we hope that our uh, thickness should be as larger, at least 5.2 millimeters, right? right? So that it will not buckle, correct? So that would be the kind of a solution for it. Um, but actually you don't need this kind of figure, right? You just use MATLAB to solve it directly, okay? So that's the idea of uh, how to convert a sizing optimization problem into a, a sizing, right, into a kind of optimization in this kind of format, okay? Then let's come to our kind of a very fancy stuff, which is called topology optimization, right? So topology optimization is something like this. This design, right? This is a very, uh, I would say, human, you know, human-like, right? Kind of like a, if if you are asked to design some kind of a part, or if you are asked to draw some kind of model, this is a model you may have, right? So they are kind of a, you know have a very flat, you know, surface, and the kind of a, there is a kind of a, you know round chamber or something like this, right? The, the kind of a, this kind of things is that we can design. But this design 
obviously it's not the optimal one, right? So you can say a lot of the material actually can be reduced and it will not affect the kind of, you know, strength, right? So for topology optimization is trying to reduce the materials, okay? Something like this. This is a result from a CAD software. So I will show you later. So we have this kind of a software that installed in my computer. We can generate this result directly, okay? This is a, the current status. So for current uh, CAD model, we can directly generate some kind of like this very, I would say, bionic structure, okay? They are, they are, they are kind of very smooth, right? They look kind of, I don't know if you, are, if you are feeling comfortable or not, but actually the, you know, it looks more bionic than this one, right? And you can see a lot of the material, they are kind of reduced, okay? So this is a, this is a, this is called a topology optimization. And here I will use the following slides to show you how to do this. Actually, I have a MATLAB code. You can try, okay? Actually, we can do the similar stuff. And uh, let's say, let's start from, again, this is 3D. 3D is very complex. Let's start from 2D, okay? We, let's start from 2D problem. Let's say uh, we have a kind of a beam, okay? A plate, right? This is a plate. If you look at the, the bottom left, this is a plate. And the plate or the kind of a beam plate is attached to a wall, right? This is a kind of a constraint fix. And we want to hold the F, right? This is a load. We want to hold the F. The optimization is something like this. We are trying to punch holes or topology optimization. The key idea is trying to find where to place the holes. Okay, that's the key idea, right? So the problem, let's put in other kind of, a, you know, in other words, so let's say, uh, let's say we want to uh, reduce half of the weight, right? Which means we want to say that half of 50% of the weight, or 50% of this kind of plate is hollow, right? It's hollow. And another 50% uh, is kind of solid, okay? This is a kind of a 50%. And then, you are trying to, you know, our design is that how to distribute the material, right? So that the distribution will be strong enough to hold this weight, right? So that's the kind of uh, optimizations. So the design, again, the problem is actually, you know, what is the design uh, variables here? The design you can do is that, for, for example, for this plate, we actually discrete Right? We discretize it into many small pixels, okay? Just like a figure or like an image, right? We have pixels. If it's 3D, we call it a voxel. For each small dot or small pixel, we want to determine, do we have material here? Is it void or is it solid? So here, each pixel will have a decision variable. Is it zero or one? How, uh, okay, let me say there is a question. Louis asks, how to determine the size of box? So that's your uh, given condition. So I, this is a given con condition. So I, uh, for example, in your application or in your kind of a, a, a field, you want to have a kind of a beam that can be like two meters long to hold a kind of car. That is a given condition, okay? The size, this kind of overall size is given. And the only de determination or the, the variable you want to do is that you discretize this kind of a box into many small pixels and are trying to um, determine which pixel is zero, which pixel, which pixel is one, okay? So I would say, again, the box is kind of a given initially, okay? Okay, yeah. can you hear me? Can, uh, okay, go ahead. Uh, so my question is how to determine I, the the size of that pixel? I mean- Oh, the pixel, that's a very good question. So yeah. the, that's a very good question. So how to determine the pixel size? So uh, here is a trade-off. You don't want to have a very small pixel, right? For example, you have a two small pixel, then your number of, uh, you know, unknowns will be, you know, kind of a, uh, you know, kind of a square, you know, becomes, it goes like, a, I don't know, 
for example, if you have one millimeter size initially, then if you decrease to 0.1 millimeter, then the number of uh, variables will be kind of like be a uh, hundred times more, right? So you can have a too small size, and also you cannot have a too large. If you're too large, then the resolution is not good. You will have this kind of zigzag and it's not continuous, then that would be bad. So there will be some kind of a you know, sweet spot that the size will be exactly you know, uh, something you can accept. So mostly topology optimization is very time consuming. So people will try to use a larger uh, kind of a resolution or larger scale first, and then gradually or somehow you know, uh, reduce the size to give a better uh, kind of a, uh, a better solution for it. Okay, so that's uh, it's this is a kind of a hyperparameter people need to you know determine first. Okay, uh, yeah. there, there is not like a, a no dimension is constant that can tell if the size is too huge or too small because in in the case of for example in CFD that is computational fluid dynamics there is a parameter that is called y plus so it's everything like a, you calculate that y plus and if y plus is more or less than one you are in the good range depending of the model that you are using so there is not something similar so, in yeah I, I think I think this is talking about the mesh right how to uh, get a mesh uh, uh, kind of a, a mesh with uh, uh, kind of enough of identity yeah, be, be, very, yeah, there are a lot of uh, consideration to determine the mesh size and the mesh grade. Mm -hmm. Yes, I agree. So people have a lot of uh, study on it. So about mostly uh, in one iteration or in one uh, kind of um, running, you have to determine the size first. Okay. So this is a again, this is a very simple case. Uh, sometimes you can have some like uh, you know adaptive uh, meshing, right? Some area you can have larger size, or sometimes you can have a smaller size. That also works. But for meshing, that's a totally new story. But here we just mentioned that this is a kind of a, um, the, the, the idea of it, right? So we just say we have this kind of a, a you know, very, I and mean, the size will be determined by some other stuff, okay? Let's say, let's assume that the size is given, okay? How about this? Okay. Yeah, I think this your 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 question is great, but I think you uh, you can look for some other details about this, how to pick the right size. Okay. So for now, we let's agree that we are using this kind of you know uh, some specific size, right? And then we are generate a bunch of uh, you know uh, different uh, pixels, and then for the decision is which for each pixel you want to determine whether it's one or zero. But sometimes you can get some intermediate, right? It's from could be 0 0.5 or 0 0.2, and then you can later filter out. So this sometimes is called density uh, methods. So it's kind of a relatively density, like um, uh, it's zero means it's void, it's air. One means it's solid. Okay, that's the decision. And for the model itself, this is a model. So again, if you look at this kind of uh, the the constraints, we have a uh, three constraints. For the first constraint is that we can set the we need to satisfy the material ratio or the mass. Okay, the volume. For example, if f f is a constant number, for example, f is 0.5, which means we need to make sure that 50 percent of the mass are reduced. Okay, that would be the kind of uh, the, the first constraint. The second constraint is given this kind of F, it will result in some kind of a deformation, right? This is a FEA. This is a this is a final element analysis based on FEA. You will get given the F, you will get the kind of a, you know the displacement or the kind of a deformation for each cell. Okay, that would be the kind of a deformation model, and for each cell, for each kind of a pixel, you will have the uh, deformation. Then, based on that, the deformation for each cell is pretty much about strain, right? Strain is something like you are kind of pulling it. So the strain. So you can actually use this term, right? The the kind of uh, displacement, you know, you double them, and then you will have the strain energy. So we hope that all the total energy could be minimized, right? Because large strain energy is bad; it will result in failures. So we hope that we can minimize 
the total string energy. And this term is objective. Sometimes it's also called compliance, okay? So that's the idea of this kind of optimization. So we are actually trying to minimize the total deformation energy, right? The string energy, given the kind of material uh, ratio, okay? So you can see that an Xe, that is the, uh, Xe is the decision variables, right? So this is a, hopefully you can get a sense of this optimization problem, right? We have the Xe and the U is actually running from, is U is actually uh, obtained from the FEA or the kind of simulation. You can get the, you know, based on this F, you can get the uh, kind of uh, displacement and then you can compute the objective, okay? Then how do we solve this problem? Any suggestions here? Um, so the idea to solve this kind of thing is sometimes people call uh, use the KKT condition, okay? Because this is a equality, this is an equality constraint, right? So we can easily find the, you know, KKT conditions. So for KKT condition, right? So this is a constraint and then it equals to the, you know, the, you know, this kind of uh, the first constraints of this. That's the, but how about the second constraint, right? So this is a trick for the optimization algorithm for this specific problem. So for each iteration, uh, for each iteration, it will solve the, the kind of a displacement or kind of solve the deformation first, okay, given the current X. So which means the U is not constraints now, it's actually solved. We directly solve this equation and then we can know the use here, right? We just plug in here. And then if we solve this kind of equation, then the problem will become just one objective and one constraint, right? So which is here. They minimize the constraints or the objective and also the constraint is this kind of volume constraint. And this kind of a simple problem has a KKT condition, right? Which is this, right? The gradient of the objective equal to or parallel to this kind of things, right? The constraints. And then we can solve this kind of um, uh, constraint first using MATLAB. We can solve this kind of equation, then we can get the X, right? And then we can update, we can run a second iteration. So the idea is that using the current X, we figure out the U. And then the problem will be simplified. And then we can solve the simplified version and get the X. And then you repeat every solve these tools. Okay, so that's the algorithm for this. Um, actually, there is a MATLAB I can show you. Let me say, uh, do I have time? Uh, let's see, I'm trying to open it. The MATLAB for this. Oh, I don't need to do this MATLAB. Actually, I can use my uh, I can use my, this one. So can you see the MATLAB now? Okay, cool. Uh, this is a, this is a code for the op topology optimization. So let's say, uh, this is a code. This code is a, has a special name. It's called the 99 uh, code of MATLAB. If you look at here, uh, this is a, a 99 uh, mm, kind of line topology of the medicine code. It's a paper, okay? It's a kind of a very well-known paper. So let me show you. This is a paper. The paper's title is this. It's called, uh, mm, this is very interesting. This is um, a pioneer in topology of optimization. So uh, let's see. A That's weird. Let me do this. So if you look at here, so this is a paper. The paper is title is this, and it already 
cited by more than a thousand you know papers that's a very uh, classic uh, code actually you can run it so here's a kind of a things uh let's run this okay for example let's run this uh this this is how to uh, call this function so the first input is the the x how many um voxel how many pixels in along the x how many pixels how many pixels along the y okay in total we have uh, 500 pixels and then we want to keep the volume ratio as um, 40 percent 0.4 okay the f is 40 percent and then p is the parameters in the model and there's some other parameters so let's just run it it's same some error right what happened so i probably need to hmm, okay it seems something goes wrong here hmm. See, it should be working. Oh, that's the result. Let me just run this again. Okay, we can see the running, right? So for iteration, it will change the you know, kind of a material distribution. If I change the size, for example, 50, and let me answer this. Okay, this is a example I show in the slides, right? So that's how we, you know, gradually update the information here. So given the initially, uh, let, let me draw it again. So initial, oops. So initially, just a plate, right? And uh, gradually punch all the pools, right? By this kind of algorithm. Uh, let's see, there's one question from Jamie. So you need to put uh, enter the comma window. Oh, I see. Okay. Uh, so this is uh, the algorithm. And we can actually dive into this code a little bit. So, for example, here. So, let's uh, just add a big point here and we're trying to run it. So the first line is trying to initialize the X, right? Because we say X is a kind of a 500 uh, uh, determined, right? 500 uh, uh, unknowns, right? So it's kind of a matrix. So for each value, it will be 0.5. That's the initialization. And then we just start with some loop and then X out. Again, this is a step one. We're trying to use FEI to obtain the kind of a, a this deformation for each for each pixel right this is the fea model and you can dive into this fea model and then at this moment this kind of uh, things is trying to figure out the gradient okay you can say dc is actually the the gradient because in if you want to use KKT to solve the problem, you have to figure out the gradient, right? The gradient of the objective and the gradient of the uh, of the of the constraint, right? So this is a kind of a figure out the gradient, and after the gra the gradient, and also the gradient will be kind of a regulated, okay? Trying to check will be figured out some like uh, very huge numbers, and then this function OC is kind of a, a um opt, opt, optimality uh criteria is trying to this is trying to solve the kt condition okay this is trying to solve the kt condition and then after it's solved then x is updated for one version okay you can see some number has been changed right from 0 0.5 to 0 0.7 and then you can uh, actually display and then you can uh output the color right so that would be, you can see this is the first iteration. We get some idea like this, okay? And then you can run again, it will do another iteration. Again, it will use a current X and trying to figure out the kind of deformation first, right? And that deformation will be used to construct the gradient. 
right? The gradient is construct, constructed, then you can solve out the KKT condition and then figure out the X, okay? And then you can take a look in, and then I can update the images, right? This is a re updated result. So after a second iteration, we got something like this. So by running more iteration, so when to, when, sh when should we exit? Uh, the idea is that if the solution has no change, then we can actually exit. That's the idea of it. So you can see finally we get this result. Okay. Cool, right? So this is a optimization. Uh, you can actually, I will upload this so you can just play with this. This is 2D. So for 3D, the similar idea, uh, but for 3D, uh, you, you know, it, it cannot be finished within like 100 codes, right? So actually there's a kind of a lot of, uh, currently a lot of uh, CAD softwares, they have the packages. For example, this is called, uh, if you look at him, this is Autodesk uh, Fusion um, like uh, 360. That's the, that's the, this CAD actually have the generative design. Generative design is actually, the, the 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 another term for topology optimization. So let me jump back to the you know our slides. So again, our method, our current methods is called density methods. There are some other kind of called level set methods we can look up later. Uh, but most people will implement the kind of um, a density methods. So here, this is a, our pack. Our CAD software can do. For example, we're using Autodesk Fusion 360. So this is input, right? This is a kind of reference model, right? This is a reference model, and this is the output model. So we can actually use the this kind of uh, Fusion 360 uh, to generate this kind of results. So here, this is how. So first, we need to, um, if you look at here, this is uh, the constraints, okay? This is all the constraints. So what the material, this is a constraints we cannot, this is, a, this kind of red thing is, we have, this is kind of obstacles. We cannot put material there. So other than that, we can put material. So pretty much that, that's the design constraints, okay? Uh, let me just, this is weird. Um, see. Uh, they are kind of, you can, uh, you can download and try to see how to like, uh, this is a software package you can use, like uh, how to design model, how to, uh, you know, give some like uh, uh, geometry and this is some constraints and this is objective. For example, for the objective, we can, what we can see is we can have two ways. One is that we can minimize the mass, the volume, right? For now, our current version is the volume is actually play as the, as a constraint, right? But in our, optimization theory for the constraint and the objective, we can switch, right? This can be some kind of, a, we can constrain on the kind of objective and pull the constraint to the objective, right? So that's pretty much the way uh, this package is doing, right? You can minimize the mass or you can maximize the stiffness or maximize stiffness is equivalent to minimize the compliance, the same, but you need to, uh, kind of a give some like um, what's the math you are targeting, right? So that's the, this is a, the formulation in our slides, okay? And if I click the wrong, there's a kind of a generating. So I can click like a generate, so it will run the simulation and give the result, but it will take a very long time. So let me just show you the result, okay? So here, this, this is a result, for example, here, and this is how I, See that this is an actual result. You can generate a similar result here. So this is, uh, if you look at here, um, this is how we do the, uh, okay. So this is a, uh, oh, let me just pull this away. We can see this, right? So that would be the idea of uh, generative design, okay? Uh, I think, that will be all for today and uh, this master's lecture. Okay, everybody. And uh, I hope that you uh, really enjoy it. And uh, okay, any other uh, questions?
before I end this lecture. Can you okay. post the um, exam codes? Sure, we'll do that. Uh, I will do that um, maybe by tomorrow morning, something like this. Okay. Okay, and don't forget our next week's meeting. Okay, so I hope that I can give you some feedback so that uh, you can have some fine tuning for your final project. Okay. So wonderful. So that will be all for today. And thank you, everybody. So, yeah, see you next week. Bye bye. All right. Thank you. Bye bye.